Well, thank you so much to Peggy and the National Museum for inviting me to come down and, and help out yet again. I'm always happy to come down to Cayman. I just love it down here. Um, and, uh, and especially thanks to Peggy and Dennis for, for hosting us and, and sharing their kitty cats with me because I have cats and I'm going through a little bit of cat withdrawal. So, uh, but anyway, without further ado, um, my name is Della. Um, I'm the Associate Director for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Um, and we're a uh, regional network. We have eight regional centers around the state of Florida. And we do education and outreach in archaeology. So we don't do big research projects. We don't do contract archaeology. We do education and outreach, uh, both maritime and on land. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we do is develop and help other agencies and organizations to develop heritage tourism products. Um, Florida, like Cayman, um, relies on its tourism industry. And a study done just about four years ago determined that over $4 billion a year comes into the state of Florida through heritage tourism. That's not people annually. That's not people going to Disney World. That's not people simply going to beaches or playing golf or whatever like that. It's people coming to visit heritage tourism sites just in our state. That's people going to museums, to historic main streets, to historic villages, and historic shipwrecks. So it's a major source of funding for the state of Florida as for other places. And I think it's a mistake for places like Florida, like Cayman, that has so many wonderful submerged heritage tourism opportunities to ignore that. <clears throat> One of the things we've been working on in Florida for about 20 years now is this idea of underwater archaeological preserves, shipwreck parks, maritime heritage trails. These things are growing in popularity all over the world. And this is just sort of a selection from various places. Every place from um, the Great Lakes to Australia, a couple of states, South Carolina, the maritime uh, the trail down in the Florida Keys. It's a product of the National Marine Sanctuary. And of course, I love to highlight our own very own here on Grand Cayman that I worked with Peggy to do several years ago. But these things are growing in popularity because they do several things. Number one, they utilize an existing resource. All of these places have heritage. It's just waiting to be interpreted. It's a way to educate a region's citizens and visitors about that heritage and the importance of preserving it. Um, and it increases a heritage tourism product. It gives local businesses, whether it's dive shops, restaurants, hotels, you name it, another way to make money from that heritage tourism product. So it really kind of hits a lot of different um, sort of uh, uh, pings on that on that graph, but also it helps to build an appreciation and a value for these sites and expresses to people very clearly why it's important to preserve them. Um, not only to preserve our history, our heritage, our sense of place, uh, but also as a sustainable tourism product. Um, so in Florida, we've been working on what we call our underwater archaeological preserves, like I said, for about 20 years. We call them our museums in the sea. Um, and this is a poster. It features um, 11 of our preserves around the state. Every place you see a little dive flag around the state map there is where one of these preserves are located. Um, and these are interpreted especially for divers and snorkelers, um, as well as pretty much anybody who spends time on the water, boaters, fishermen, you name it. Anybody can get some enjoyment and some value out of these. Um, and it does serve things. It protects and preserves the resource by educating people about them, certainly educates the public about the real treasure of Florida shipwrecks and every place else is shipwrecks, which is their history, not the uh, non-existent treasure that you know is played up in the media. Certainly it provides a means of education through recreation, and then again it promotes that heritage tourism. Uh, in Florida, it's a pro program primarily of the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, which is part of the Division of Historical Resources, which is part of the Florida Department of State. It's it's a government product um, from the state of Florida, and we at FPAN, Florida Public Archaeology Network, um, work very closely with the, with the archaeologists with the state to develop these preserves. I worked for the Bureau for about eight years, and this was my primary responsibility was developing these preserves, so it's a thing that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, so what I'd like to do with the idea, keep in the back of your mind that this is something that Peggy and I have been talking about, um, developing similar products for the Cayman Islands, uh, let me take you on a tour through a few of our shipwreck preserves so you can get the kind of idea of the information that we learned as we get into researching these sites, learning more about them and how they relate to our history and heritage. So the very first one in Florida was the Urca de Lima, and it was part of the 1715 Spanish plate fleet that wrecked off the east coast of Florida. Um, and Urca is just a type of ship. It's a big round-bodied store ship, and it belonged to Miguel de Lima. So literally, it's Mr. Lima's Urca. Um, and it was uh, carrying... Um, 
uh, personal goods and also um, early on when it was discovered actually by treasure hunters in the 1920s pretty early they were finding wedges of silver on it they called it the wedge wreck because they didn't bother to do any research into what its actual name was and these wedges of silver were contraband they were put in the false bottoms of barrels um, and they were trying to smuggle them back to Spain which is kind of interesting um, but a hurricane uh, wrecked the fleet um, it crashed against the east coast of Florida um, and uh, they began as I said to be discovered in the 1920s rediscovered because they were known about for a long time here's a map from 1774 an early British survey of Florida Florida belonged to the British between um, 70 hold on a sec, 62 and 82 1762 and 1782 um, so Bernard Romans was sent to survey the entire area um, and he, this is a wonderful map and he says opposite this river perished the admiral commanding the plate fleet 1715 the rest of the fleet 14 in number between this and Bleach Yard. There weren't 14 vessels in the fleet. He was off on his numbers, but they knew exactly where it was. And as a matter of fact, Romans in some of his documents talks about his, the workers and the surveyors who were with him picking up um, silver coins off the beach while they were there. So in the 1720s, treasure hunters began to kind of find these sites. Of course, that's long before scuba was invented. Uh, we've got a wonderful photograph of a, uh, a dike that had been built out from the shore out to where the shipwreck is. It's only about 100 yards offshore, and there was a backhoe out on the end of it, and they were literally scooping up chunks of the shipwreck and dumping it onto a barge and then picking through it. It was really kind of incredible. Um, so a lot of the shipwrecks, unfortunately, were disturbed and damaged, but there is some, some things still there. Um, and the the city of Fort Pierce approached the state of Florida in the early 80s and said, hey, let's stop letting the treasure hunters destroy this site. People like to go out there and snorkel and scuba. Let's turn it into an underwater park. And so working with the state, we developed the first preserve. Um, and this is a, uh, a sort of a map, a guide of what's there. There's still some structure there, a trench worn into the bedrock where the ship rocked back and forth on its keel. Um, and then it was marked with an underwater plaque that designated the site as an underwater archaeological preserve. Well, it proved to be very popular, um, drew a lot of diving tourists to Fort Pierce, and so the Keys said, hey, we also have a Spanish fleet, we want a shipwreck preserve too. So the state went down to the Florida Keys where the 1733 ship, uh, Spanish fleet had wrecked, um, and as a matter of fact, they had left Havana on a Friday the 13th, so really they should have known something bad was going to happen to them when they got away. Uh, but 22 vessels uh, left Havana and 18 of them were wrecked. Um, but the one that was chosen to become an underwater preserve was one called San Pedro, and it was a Dutch-built galleon under contract to Spain, uh, carrying porcelain, silver, and, and, uh, and personal goods. Um, but the fleet was scattered along 80 miles of the Florida Keys. There was a lot of choices there to be made, and actually it was a result of a field school looking at every one of these sites systematically that chose San Pedro as probably the best candidate for a preserve. And here's uh, those shipwreck sites all along the Keys. Um, we have the benefit, actually, of an honest to God Spanish treasure map in finding these sites. This is from the Archivo General de Indias in Seville. Um, and the um, uh, direction is off a little bit, but all these little sites down here mark which the shipwrecks after they went down. Because, you know, once the, uh, these sites wrecked, it's not like the Spanish said, oh, well, darn, it's all gone. These sites are in shallow water. They immediately sent out salvage crews from Havana to start recovering the material from these wrecked ships. And as a matter of fact, in the 1733 fleet, more gold and silver was actually recovered from those wrecked ships than was listed on the official manifests. <laughs> Again, evidence of contraband and smuggling. So by the time the treasure hunters got to them in the 1950s and 60s, in the case of the 33s, um, there wasn't really a whole lot left. The Spanish did a really good job of getting their stuff back. Um, but San Pedro is a beautiful site. It's in about 18 feet of water. It's in a white sand pocket surrounded by turtle grass. It's really one of the oldest artificial reefs in the Florida Keys, and it's just teeming with sea life, and it's a beautiful site. Um, it has also since become a Florida state park. So not only is it an underwater preserve, but it's a state park as well. So so um, yet another instance of, uh, of two branches of government, Department of State and Department of Environment, managing to work together for a happy outcome. Shockingly, it does happen occasionally. Um, in the case of San Pedro, we actually made some replica cement cannons. Her, her original cannons were removed by treasure hunters pretty early. Um, and if you drive, a lot of to go to Florida and drive along A1A, the overseas highway through the Keys, which is a beautiful drive from Miami down to Key West. But in front of every little dive shop and strip mall, there is a rotting cannon or anchor from one of the 33s 
because they were pulled up and never conserved. And so we're losing them, unfortunately. Um, but we had some replica cement cannons made and put down on the site. And originally, they looked just like replica cement cannons. Uh, now, however, they've got a nice layer of marine growth on them, and they look like the real thing. So it's pretty, pretty good. Um, skipping ahead, I wanted to tell you about Massachusetts, USS Massachusetts. This one has probably one of the most interesting histories of all of our underwater preserves. It's our nation's oldest battleship, and it's still there. It's sunk off Pensacola. Um, it's BB number two. It was part of what they call the Indiana class of uh, pre-dreadnought battleships. Indiana was number one, Massachusetts was number two, and Oregon was number three. Um, Indiana and Oregon ended up getting broken up for scrap, but Massachusetts survives. Um, it was commissioned in 1896. It saw action in the Spanish-American War. It was decommissioned and recommissioned a couple different times. And finally, in 1921, with uh, the advent of World War I and the development of all big gun battleships, it was obsolete, and so it was taken to Pensacola and scuttled for target practice. <clears throat> and here it is, offshore. Here's the white sand beaches of Pensacola in the back. Um, and this is a wonderful photograph. Um, it was used for target practice. They shelled it from shore-based guns. And this was taken from the deck of a little snapper fishing boat that's really too close. <laughs> um, but anyhow, so the, the army actually bombed it. The, the, the worry was that an enemy battleship would threaten the, uh, the coasts of the United States and uh, could the, uh, the army successfully repel an enemy battleship. Well, they just bombed the snot out of Massachusetts for about two months and then said, yes, I think that we can in fact protect the coast. And so they left it there. Um, and it proved to be very popular amongst the local people. Here's a one, couple of wonderful old photographs from the 1950s. People People on calm days um, would paddle out there and stand on the 13-inch gun turrets and fish, um, or some really early scuba diving going on. But my favorite part of this photo are these ladies on the mat. So, uh, so the local people of Pensacola just fell in love with, with Massachusetts because it was a place to go really and kind of party on the weekends, you know. Um, in the 1950s, a, um, uh, a scrap metal company wanted to um, salvage the whole thing, and the people of Pensacola put their foot down and said, absolutely not. And so there was actually a court case, and the result was an injunction that, that transferred title of Massachusetts to the state of Florida, which is unusual. Usually the United States Navy doesn't give up title to any of its ships anywhere for any reason. But in this case, uh, the state of Florida actually owns Massachusetts. And it's still there. A lot of her upper works are gone. They've been kind of beaten down by hurricanes over the years. Um, but she's still there. She's 350 feet long, chrome nickel steel and 30 feet of water. Her 13 inch turrets still stick out of the water, uh, but to swim through her is like an underwater mountain climb. Uh, this is her enormous 18 inch armor belt on the port side that's been displaced. There's a huge Goliath grouper that lives down here. This is her rudder turning gear. Um, it's just an enormous dive. Um, and so we, we, in developing this to be an underwater preserve as part of the interpretive product, we wanted to provide divers with a guide so they'd know what they were looking at. And so utilizing her 1910 refit plans, which we got from the Naval Historical Center, we were able to map the ship, and this is what she looks like today. Here's those big 13-inch turrets, fore and aft. She had four 8-inch guns. They're still kind of lying off to the side. Her fighting tops here. You can still see her torpedo tube in the bow. It's just an amazing dive, absolutely amazing. And this is the underwater guide that we developed. So there are 30 stops. So you can start and go all the way around her on a self-guided tour and see all of these features of this wonderful battleship, um, as well as some of the sea life you're likely to encounter out there. Um, moving on, Half Moon, this is down in Miami. This one also has an interesting story. This, this a little wreck is only in about 12 feet of water. It was known for many years. I called it the Bear Cut Wreck because nobody knew its name. And then once we started doing the research, this fascinating story emerged. Um, this was a German racing yacht. She was built in 1908 as a wedding present for a German countess. She was called Germania. Um, she proved to be so fast, they raced her in the international regattas at Cowles in England and Kiel in Germany. Um, um, and she was so fast, she began beating the Kaiser's yacht, which is not apparently what you wanted to do in pre-World War I Germany. The Kaiser had an almost identical sister ship built um, and named her Meteor. Um, after um, a, a several successful years of racing, um, she was actually in England um, for Cow's Week, for the, the racing week, uh, when World War I broke out. And she was impounded by the British Navy. And her sailors became some of the first uh, German prisoners of war, World War I. So the Count spent the entire 
um, war trying to get her back, all these letters back and forth, and he never got her back. She ended up being sold um, to a couple of Norwegians who brought her to the United States. She was bought by a former assistant secretary of the Navy, um, and he ended up um, um, getting in a really bad storm that dismasted her and it scared him, so he sold her. And she ended up being brought down to Miami. Oh, here's this wonderful picture. This is uh, Germania, our vessel, and then this is Kaiser Wilhelm's meteor, which was the almost identical sister of her, um, racing uh, at Kiel. Um, this picture came from the, the German uh, Maritime Museum. So you, know, you start reaching your little tentacles of research out. You never know what you're going to find. Um, so she was brought down to Miami. And here is a wonderful um, article, um, typical sort of um, accurate reporting from the Miami Herald. Yacht once owned by Kaiser to be floating cabaret. She was not, in fact, owned by the Kaiser. Um, and this threw us off for a long time until we figured out the Herald was wrong. Um, but, uh, but here she is underwater. As I said, she's only about 12 feet. But those wonderful racing lines are still very evident. And and she's home now um, to a variety of sea life. When she was brought to Miami, she was, in fact, anchored offshore to be used as a floating cabaret. This was during the time of prohibition in the United States. So people were uh, rowing out to her on these uh, you know, moonless sort of calm nights and partying offshore. Um, she broke her moorings in a storm in the 19, late 1930s and, and ended up wrecking on this little um, sandbar in Bear Cut, which is right near Key Biscayne. Um, we were very fortunate while we were doing research. We found, I mentioned that she had been sold to a former secretary of the Navy. Um, and we found his grandchildren who still had her bell, which still says Germania. Um, and so they loaned us her bell, as well as some fantastic photographs um, from their uh, great grandfather um, to go in a, a nice little exhibit that's, that's on Key Biscayne. Um, this is what she looks like today. I mentioned those nice racing lines. She was hit by a larger vessel at some point um, that broke her. Uh, her, uh, her starboard side um, and then uh, but there's still a lot to see and it's a wonderful site it's so shallow you can snorkel it a lot of people go out there with their kids it's a good place for teaching people how to dive so a lot of people visit the site and so we're finally able to put a name and a story with the bear cut wreck um, Weimar, this is, I think this is the last one I'll tell you about, and then I'll turn it over to Amanda. But this is another one, this kind of this nondescript vessel that nobody really thought anything about, and then it turns out it has this amazing story. Um, she was built in England in 1919 as a gunboat. She was called Kilmarnock, um, kill class of gunboats. She's got these long, thin lines. She was very fast, um, 70, 170 feet long, but only 30 feet of beam, so she was long and lean. Um, steel hull, triple expansion steam engine, she was very fast. Um, she ended up being... Um, sold from the British Navy uh, to someone who used her for running rum, who was caught and the vessel was confiscated. And so we're sitting in this rum runner's row of these confiscated vessels when she was seen by Admiral Richard Byrd when he was looking for vessels to go on his Antarctic expedition in 1928. And he thought that she would work fine. He needed a vessel that had a hold big enough to hold the crates that contained the airplane that he intended to fly over the pole. So he found this one. Um, he renamed her Eleanor Bowling in honor of his mother. Uh, but she was so long and lean, she got in the southern seas, and she rolled so much and was so unstable, her crew called her ever more rolling. <laughs> Which I think is pretty funny. Um, so anyhow, so he used her... <clears throat> Um, in his Antarctic expedition, and when he got her back, she was in terrible, terrible shape. Um, and so uh, he sold her to a shipping company called the Weimar Shipping Company. Um, this is a wonderful photo of her from the National Archives. Well, Weimar was a tramp steamer. She went wherever she could get a cargo. Um, and in 1942, World War II, she had come into a little town called Port St. Joe, Florida, which you have probably never heard of. Port St. Joe is in the panhandle, kind of near what we call the Big Bend, or Florida makes that bend. Um, and it's a, it's a little port, and it has been for all of its life, a lumber port primarily. And so she had come in to take on a load of lumber. She was going to um, take it down to South America. Um, and uh, she started, she was loaded up to the gunnels and even above. Um, the pilot got in her started taking her out of the channel. It was a calm day, no wind, no problem. They made a sharp turn in the channel, no problem. And then she started going down. The pilot managed to get her out of the middle of the channel before she sank. There was no loss of life. Everybody got off of her. Well, the local people started saying sabotage. Um, 1942 again, you know, there's Germans in the Gulf. So uh, to the point that the United States Coast Guard actually sent down some investigators to figure out the story. And I managed to find, we were doing research, I found their report in the National Archives along with this photo on that onion skin paper, you know. I'm sure I'm the first person to look at it since the 1940s. And it's this fantastic story of these uh, investigators going down and talking to the local people. And there's stories of a, a strange German, maybe, woman. She's blonde, and she sits in the back of this local bar. And in my mind, she looks like Marlene.
Anna Dietrich. And so, and how sailors would come in and she'd talk to them in the middle of foreign language and then she'd leave with them and then she'd come back alone and then she'd meet with the captain and they'd natter on in a foreign language. I mean, very sinister goings on in little Port St. Joe, Florida. Um, also, the sailors who were on board, the tramp uh, sailors who were on board were stayed in the little town because the Weimar Shipping Company thought that they would be able to raise her and continue on their way. Well, of course, all the young men are all fighting the war, so the sailors start squiring around the local young ladies, which does not go over well at all in Port St. Joe, Florida. So there's just lots of problems happening. Um, the investigators ended up going out to the wreck site and happened to be there when one of the salvage divers came up, and he said the vessel was in such poor shape they couldn't even patch it. Every time they touched it, the hull would disappear in a cloud of rust. Um, so there was no way they were going to be able to patch it. So they ended up salvaging the cargo of lumber. The sailors went off. Port St. Joe calmed down. Um, and the investigators in their official report say that there was really no real evidence of sabotage. Uh, but if you talk to the local people there and some of the old timers who were youngsters then, they are still absolutely convinced uh, that it was German sabotage trying to block their channel that sunk Weimar. So here is this wonderful site. It's now, it actually was dynamited by the Army Corps in the 1950s because um, it was a hazard to navigation. But there's still a lot of it there. And it's about 20 feet of water, white sand bottom. It's actually teeming with fish. The local dive shop takes people out there all the time, teaches people to dive on it. Um, and it's a fantastic site. So, so that's just kind of a little tour through some of our preserves. I'd like to tell you about all 11 of them, but we'd be here until tomorrow. Um, but all of these sites are interpreted through several means. I mentioned the underwater guide that we made for Massachusetts. Here's one for another one of our, vessel, of our shipwrecks. Um, and so this is uh, to enable divers to go down and do a self-guided tour around the site to know what it is that they're looking at. And also, the identifies some of the sea life. We also have a series of brochures that talks about these shipwrecks um, and gives their histories as well as their GPS coordinates and instructions for safe diving as well as a really strong preservation message. Um, and they're also featured on our Maritime Heritage Trail in Florida as well. Um, here's that wonderful poster um, that shows all of our shipwrecks around the state. And I have to point out uh, Mr. Bill Trotter. He's our local um, in Florida, uh, local to Florida, uh, maritime artist. And he's painted um, all of these vessels, even some that we don't have any photos of. He'll look through the research and as much as we can, and he'll come up with a great image of what these vessels look like. Um, and then they're all also marked with an underwater plaque. Um, and this is a bronze plaque set in a cement monument. And this designates the site as an underwater preserve, as well as a Florida heritage site. Um, and lets all divers know that they're diving on a very historic um, and important site. And of course, everybody likes to have their picture made by it as well. Um, we've also started um, hanging uh, brushes on there, you know, so divers can scrub off the plaques for us, you know. So a little uh, community support as far as heritage preservation goes. Um, and we've also managed to list all of these sites on our National Register of Historic places, which is pretty unusual for shipwrecks. Usually this is historic buildings, you know, that kind of thing. And so to get a shipwreck listed is pretty unusual. So uh, we're very pleased about that as well. Um, and I want to invite you to visit museumsinthesea.com. That's our website that features these underwater preserves, gives you the history. You can virtually visit the site. This is good for people who maybe don't dive or can't make it down to see them. We've got some wonderful underwater uh, um, photos and videos, as well as all the history of the site um, that people can, can visit and learn about as well. So so envision this kind of thing for Cayman. You know, the message is take only photos and leave only bubbles, which people who dive on reefs already understand. It's time to take that message to the shipwrecks, you know, and leave them there for our kids and our grandkids and our great -grand grandkids to be able to visit as well. Um, so these are things that, that are um, relatively easy to do. It takes community support and a will, and, and there's always a, when there's a will, there's a way. Um, and, and Peggy and I have been scheming on this for a while. So keep these kinds of things in mind. And if this is a thing that you would like to see um, for Cayman, then, then I invite you to maybe contact who with the minister and say this is a thing that they'd like to see, because if we can get some support, um, then we'll be happy to, to start developing these kinds of things. Um, and just I want to finish up by uh, showing you uh, USS Narcissus. Oh, I'm missing, missing a photo. Um, Narcissus was a uh, Civil War transport um, that actually just after the war was over with Lost With All Hands off Tampa. And it's going to be our next preserve. It's opening in January. Um, and this is a wonderful um, side scan uh, image of it showing some of its wreckage and a big old Goliath grouper that lives on it. Isn't that cool that you can see in the side scan? So it's a growing program. Um, there's no reason um, to stop it. It's popular. The people around Florida, our diving citizens and visitors love it. It brings in a lot of benefit to the local community, and I could see it doing the very same thing here. So that's a, oh, there it is. I didn't realize I had it on an extra click there. Um, so anyhow, that's all I have for you. Um, I'll be sticking around, of course, afterwards, and I'm happy to answer any questions.